I now invite the next speaker of the session, uh, Professor Haberton Wender, uh, from the Institute of Physics, Federal University of NATO, Brazil. Uh, he's going to speak on the topic, basic principles and recent advances of photocatalytic fuel cells. Professor Haberton. Good afternoon for everyone. Yeah. Thank you for, you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Eberton. Uh, I'm a professor here in Brazil and also thank you for the opportunity to present my work. The topic of my presentation today is the basic principles and recent advances in photocatalytic fuel cells. The outline of my presentation uh, is, is starting with a question, what is a photocatalytic fuel cell? And also after this introduction, we will talk about some definitions and some fundamentals. And after that, uh, I'm going to show two application cases of my, my research group here. Uh, one is the 3D printed membraneless microfluidic fuel cells in a black titanium oxide photonodes for direct methanol photofuel cells. So what is a photofuel cell? So we can think about a photofuel cell as a marriage of a photocatalysis and fuel cells. But let's talk about uh, each one individually to, to take a, a big picture. And of course, this is for no expert. And I ask for a little patience for those who are already familiar with the photofuel cell uh, technique. So first, uh, in the photocatalysis, we have mainly three steps, the light absorption, charge separation, and surface reactions. So in the first one, uh, the light absorption, uh, solar photons or light photons, uh, they are absorbed by a semiconductor powder that we call photocatalyst or a semiconductor electrode that we call electrocatalyst. If the energy of the photons is are equal or greater than, than the band gap of the semiconductor. In the second step of charge separation, so electrons that were excited to the conduction band, they need to migrate to the surface of the photocatalysts, as also must do the holes at the valence band must migrate to the surface of the photocatalyst. And then the surface reactions, the third step can take place. When we look to a fuel cell, we have a, a, a similar case, but we have two electrodes. We have two catalysts, one as the anode and the other as the cathode. Uh, and we have, of course, two sides, the anode side and the cathodic side. And the fuel cell is always fed by a fuel and by an oxidant. Here in this example, we have hydrogen as fuel and oxygen as oxidant. So hydrogen is oxidize it and lose electrons to the external circuit that goes to the cathodic side. So protons uh, permeate to a, a membrane separator and goes to the cathodic side where it reacts with oxygen and form water uh, and also some heat as the output of the cell. So if we combine these two technologies, we have the photocatalysis, photocatalytic fuel cells, sorry. So, the main advantage is that in the photofuel cell, we have cheaper electrodes because in the fuel cell technology, they always, and in the majority of the case, I can see that, I can, I can, I can say that they have uh, noble metals. So if we have semiconductor uh, replacing the, the noble metals, we can lower the price of the device. So the first report, of a photocatalytic fuel cell uh, date back to 2005 with a titanium dioxide coated on a FTO glass anode and a platinum cathode using ammonia as fuel. So ammonia is oxidized and oxygen was reduced and the device produced power. Uh, a photofuel cell can decompose organic pollutants and not only hydrogen as in the example before, so we can use pollutants, pharmaceuticals, pesticides, alcohols, and so on as fuel, and simultaneously convert the chemical energy and the solar energy into electricity. Uh, we can not only reduce oxygen, water, but we can also 
use, for example, CO2 as the oxidant, and therefore it can also be regarded as a, capture, a carbon capturing device. So such design potentially offers an alternative solution to the global energy and the environmental crisis and problems we are facing worldwide. And it might start a huge evolution to conventional wastewater treatment technologies and microenergy generation, because we can have both at the same device. We can, for example, use the photofossil to treat wastewater and also to generate microenergy for uh, low power uh, systems. So uh, we can see that uh, a photofoil cell have some uh, similarities with uh, photoelectrochemical cells, but they are not equal. And, and here I, I can highlight some mainly differences. In a photoelectrochemical cell, we have two electrodes, also the, the working electrode and a counter, a counter electrode. Here, a reference electrode. Uh, let me put the laser pointer here, yes. And we can see that this device is not spontaneous. You need to input energy to the oxidation and reduction uh, take place. But in a photofuel cell, we have a galvanic cell. So the Gibbs free energy is negative and the device operates spontaneously, spontaneously generating power and uh, without consuming energy. So we can use this energy for uh, an application. In the literature, we have different types of photofoil cells I would like to talk about uh, as some definitions and fundamental uh, basics of the photofoil cell. In the first uh, uh, figure here, we have a conventional foil cell with two uh, metal-based electrodes. And uh, of course, this has uh, a uh, higher efficiency, but it also, it also have a, a higher price to, to the device. So here we have the open circuit voltage that is defined by the difference of the potential of the oxidation and the reduction reaction. But we also take electrons from the fuel and these electrons goes to the external circuit, to the cathode and to reduce the oxidant and the device operates uh, spontaneously. When we have a photocatalytic fuel cell, at least one of the electrodes are a semiconductor, is a semiconductor material, and under light excitation, electrons are uh, excited to the conduction band, and also due to the band bending, they go to the, to the substrate that's, that should be metallic, and these electrons are captured to the external circuit and goes to the cathodic side the holes migrates to the surface of the catalyst to conduct the oxidation reactions or to generate radicals to do the job. And on the cathodic side, we have the reduction of the oxidant and we have a higher OCV compared to the fuel cell because now we have the OCV defined as the difference of the quasi Fermi level of the semiconductor and the, the reduction potential here. This is an example for the photo, photo anode, but we can exchange, we can use a P-type semiconductor and a dark anode, and we have a similar concept. When we have two semiconductors, we have a dual photo electrode photofuel cell, and then we have here a P-type semiconductor uh, working to that, together with the N-type photo anode, and we have even higher OCV here because now we have two quasi Fermi levels, and once we choose the proper materials, we can maximize the OCV of the cell. We can define the photofoil cell by the type of the reactors also. In our first example here, the PFC may operate passively in a stationary condition uh, where the current is controlled by diffusion and we have to periodically extract and feed uh, the reactants to the cell. At this condition, uh, the system is called a batch fuel cell. We can also separate the uh, anolyte and the catalyte by a membrane. And it's highly desired because we can avoid crossover of the reactants. It is also a stationary cell and it's called a H type cell. And in both cases, we have QH controlled by diffusion. 
but we can also have a flow cell. If we have a flow cell, the heat is not uh, anymore controlled by diffusion, by, but by forced convection. So we can force the reactants through the electrodes or over the electrodes, as we will talk later. Uh, we can also have a microfluid fuel cell, not also a, full, a, a flow cell, right? but a, microfluid, a microfluidic flow cell. So the difference here is, here is the height of the channel, that it's on the micro scale, and it facilitates the photo excitation as well, because light uh, has to travel a short distance to, to meet the semiconductor. So the pollutant mitigation is improved since some intact fuel can be photoelectrochemically converted at the columnar channel. So we have some examples here. The first one is the flow over configuration where the fuel and the oxidant flows to, to the cell, but over the surface of the photoanode and the cathode and goes to the output of the cell. The second uh, uh, case is the air breathing is the same, but now taking air from, from oxygen from the air and then we have the oxidant, but also the oxygen from there, and then we can maximize the power generation. Uh, we can also have a flow through configuration where the, the fuel and the oxygen flow through the electrodes. It has to pass through the electrodes. Here, the electrodes are porous materials to, to permit the, the, the reactants to pass through the, the the, the material, and also it increases the, the collision of the reactants with the semiconductor and maximize the power. We can also have a dual pass configuration where we force two eyes, uh, the reactants to, to uh, travel through the, the, the electrode. The first here and the second in the, the incoming, and the second in the outcoming. We can also have the, these two semiconductors face-to-face uh, -face or shoulder-to-shoulder. -shoulder. And they, uh, this one has the advantage to be illuminated by once. So you have both faced to the, directed to the sun, for example, and they can operate it. And here we have the face-to-face -face configuration where light not absorbed in the first electrode is absorbed in the second electrode. It's the same as the tandem configuration for the solar cells. Mm -hmm. So the most used photo anodes are in type semiconductors because of the bend bending, as I said before, which facilitates the holes to go to the, to the surface of the materials for oxidation reactions, as also do the p-type semiconductors at the cathodic side so the bend bending of p-type semiconductors are desired there and also maximize OCB. So the most used materials are titanium oxide, uh, tungsten oxide, iron oxide, bismuth vanadate, and so on. And as p-type semiconductors, we have only few materials that can do the job. And the most used are the Cooper oxide-based ones. So after this brief introduction, uh, I would like to talk about some application cases. Cases. The first one is the vanadium uh, bismuth vanadate uh, semiconductor with some platinum platinum oxide co-catalysts in a very special configuration I'm showing showing here. Uh, this is the first report of a reusable 3D printed microfluid fuel cell that we can see here. Uh, it is a recent publication of my group in partnership with the Electrochemics, Electrochemistry Research Group here at the UFMS Brazil, and also the University of Nottingham by the professor Jason Fernandes. We developed a uh, vanadium bismuth oxide with platinum, platinum oxide and to uh, remove a pollutant and produce energy here through oxygen reduction. So the scheme of the cell is like I'm shown here. Uh, we have a, a microfluid fuel cell uh, fed by rhodamine B dye as a model which water pollutant and oxygen being reduced at the cathode side uh, by using a mixed, mixed media where we have a nitrogen saturated rhodamine B 
uh, sodium sulfide solution in the analyte and oxygen saturated uh, sulfuric acid in the cathodic and the catholyte. When uh, uh, we look at the anode of the cell, we have the branch shaped particles of bismuth vanadate with the size of about 200 nanometers. But looking uh, at higher mag magnification by high resolution transmission electron microscopy, we can see small particles deposited over this branch edge particles, and uh, the interplan interplanar distances match well with the 110 planes of platinum oxide here. The device cost, cost about $2.5, so it's a cheap technology. Here we have a, a disassembled cell to show how it works. We have an upper part and a bottom part and a middle uh, PDMS microchannel and the, the porous electrode here connected to copper wires. And here we, we did a test with two different dyes, uh, one red and another blue to show the columnar channel. So we, we, we don't have a membrane, so we have the flow and the flow maintains a columnar channel without crossover of the reactant here. We did the characterization of the material. So we could see that we have already the mono monoclinic scale light phase of vanadium bismuth oxide with some preferential orientation in the 0, 4, 0 uh, phase phase sets. We have an indirect band gap of 2.45 electron volts. And also after platinum deposition, we have an increase in light absorption in the visible region here. Uh, the vanadium and bismuth XPS spectra were in agreement with the pentavalent and trivalent states of vanadium and bismuth, as we expected. But when we look at, at the oxygen after platinum deposition, we can see a new peak here compared, compared to this case here without platinum. And so we have uh, oxygen platinum contribution. So we know that we have oxidized platinum, but when we look to platinum 4F high resolution spectra, we can see a mixture of metallic platinum and two oxidation states, the platinum 2 and platinum 4. So the, the photo anode, it's bismuth vanadate with platinum, platinum 2, platinum 4 uh, co-catalyst. It's, uh, the concentration is 0 0.75 uh, weight percent. So we have a very low concentration of platinum that increase the activity of the photoanode as we will see here. We did some half cell measurements to show that uh, the onset potential of oxidation is at about 0 0.25 volts and the onset potential for oxygen reduction is at 0 0.58 volts. So we have a theor theoretical OCV of 0 0.33 volts. So we have some information of our fuel cell. This is not the half cell, but the full cell operation. We have a photoanode with 0 0.75 platinum in vanadium bismuth oxide. We have a dark cathode here with carbon paper and platinum carbon deposed on that. They analyzed the catalyte as we talked before and light intensity here is two cents. As we can see, uh, the OCV ranges from uh, 0 0.41 to 0 0.48 volts for different flow rates and the best uh, activity uh, power was for 100 microliters per minute here. And we have maximum powers of about uh, 0 0.5 milliwatts per square centimeter here. Uh, as a result, the cell operator is stable stably and is able to produce the highest power ever reported uh, for uh, rhodamine B fuel. We also test the long long time stability. We could see that the cell operates uh, with good stability up to six hours that we tested. And 
uh, and it's clear that it can harvest energy from the pollutant while, while part of the fuel travel over the electrodes also face degradation. Uh, as we can see here in the photograph, we start with a solution rhodamine B and we could remove the color after the six hours of operation and with uh, almost a stable current. In terms of mechanism, we have the excitation of the BVO by visible light photons, and we can also have excitation of the platinum oxide here, and the electrons are injected to the, the platinum oxide shell, and we have a metal core, because the, the reduction, uh, the, these electrons can reduce the platinum, so we have, uh, if we continue operation of the cell, we will have more and more platinum zero, and also we have extraction of electrons to the external circuit, as we could see. As another example, I would like to show the black titanium photoanodes here. So in this uh, work, very recently accepted for publication in the Applied Materials and Interfaces, we have a bad single photoelectrode photofuel cell, it's not a microfluid one. We have also not the flow system, we have a stationary system with defective uh, titanium in the photoanode. The, the titanium nanoparticles were synthesized by the hydrolysis of the titanium isopropyl oxide here and cal with calcination at 450 degrees for obtaining the anatase phase. And after that, with the anatase titanium powder, we we made a mixture with boron, uh, sodium boron hydride, and we heated in the argon uh, flow at 350 for one hour to induce defects and also to increase visible light absorption in the titanium dioxide. We did the characterization of the material. As we can see by high angle annular dark fields, we have uh, spherical and agglomerated particles with about 150 to 300 nanometers, and carbon. And sorry, here is titanium oxygen, and the combination of titanium and oxygen is very uh, homogeneous. We, when we look for the transmission microscopy, we can also see the particles, but looking closer, we can see that we have uh, an self-assembly self of smaller particles. And ultra high resolution, we can see that we have very small nanoparticles of about 20, 30 nanometers, and they are self-assembled on this, the bigger particles. And we have the large spacing here that matches with the one, zero, one planes of the tet tetragonal anatase phase. So after the basic characterizations, we did some XRD, but not only XRD, but also the heat yield refinements to see the reduction of the particles and for the redux, reduced particles we can see that we have a contribution of titanium 3 plus as expected and and here we have about 20 percent of titanium 3 plus replacing the titanium 4 plus and the pristine material here the to sample was very similar to the standard that we use it uh, also for heat yield refinements. So when we look to absorption, we have uh, increased visible light absorption, as we can see here. We have uh, the, almost the same uh, band gap with different uh, concentrations of sodium borohydride. So BTO5, BTO10, BTO20 have increasing concentrations of sodium borohydride, but uh, we I'm gonna look for the, the BTO5 sample here. When we look to the BTO5 sample, we have uh, an extended valence band. So we have intra-BAP states above the valence band here when we self-doped the titanium to form the black titanium. We measure also the flat band potential by Motschotsky. And we can see that the flat band and the conduction band shift to more negative values of the self-doping. So we have changings at both the valence band and at the conduction band with this treatment with sodium borohydride. 
uh, we did Hammond spectroscopy and EPR to to search for the, the, the defects and we can see the peaks from Anatas as expected but we have the main peak with a uh, shift that is uh, ascribed to defects at the titanium dioxide and formation of the black titanium. When we look to this curve here, we have this, the sample, reduced sample with a huge contribution of titanium 3 plus and oxygen vacancies also. So here are the house cell measurements and the fuel cell measurements. So we have uh, only one electrolyte. Uh, it's an air saturated uh, sodium sulfide solution with 10% methanol in volume. We have stationary condition, no agitation overall, and we illuminated the system with uh, 200 milliwatts uh, per square centimeter. We can see here the polarization curve uh, where the BTO5 sample performs better than the other ones, and the black curve here is the pristine titanium oxide without the reduction process. As we can see, the system uh, the, the pristine titanium has uh, a low efficiency and we have improved efficiency we, when we treat it in the condition of BTO5 sample. We have the maximum power of about 22 uh, microwatts per square centimeter. When we look at the individual reactions, we have here the oxidation of rhodamine B and here the reduction of oxygen and we can see that we have a theoretical OCV of 0 0.85 with Maxwell with the experimental obtained one that was maximum for BTO, BTO5 photonodes with 0 0.83 volts and a photocoolant density of 93 microamps per centimeter squared. So it's important to show that we have a 2000% improvement in output power when we compare pristine titanium oxide with the self-doped PTO5 photoanode. We also investigate the six hour stability and we have uh, this increase of coolant in the beginning of the reaction that is ascribed to surface cleaning of the electrode and after that we have a nice steady coolant. Uh, for further insights, we investigate the photo node after the six hours, years of illumination. And we can see that surface defects were eliminated. Uh, looking here, the titanium 3 plus contribution of XPS was removed, as also was the, the oxygen defects here. We have pictures of the electrode before and after the six hours of operation and then we cannot see color changes. And by looking at the Hammond spectroscopy, we have a similar a spectra. So we have remove, removed the surface defects but maintained the book defects. And we can show therefore that the book defects are the rating limiting for the higher efficiency of this photonode. Talking about the mechanism, we have the excitation of the black titanium and oxidation of methanol here. Electrons are collected to the platinum cathodic size and there we have a reduction of oxygen and we can also have water reduction there. So my thanks goes to some collaborators here uh, and in Brazil and outside Brazil in the University of Peshawar, Professor Sajad Yula, uh, Jason Fernandes, University of Nottingham, and also some other colleagues of Brazil. Uh, my thanks also to the students of my group, the funding agencies, the institutions, and also I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk about my work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Everton, for the nice presentation. Now the floor is open for questioning. If there are any questions, any questions? Uh, if there are no questions, uh, can I ask you a very small question, Professor Anderton? 
Okay, and I want to know about the conversion efficiency of these kind of uh, cells, photo conversion cells. What is the maximum conversion efficiency we can achieve right now? So, uh, in terms of uh, efficiency, we can talk about the maximum power, that mm. is the energy we can generate, but also about the removal of the pollutants. So, for pollutant removal, we can achieve 100% removal after mm. two, three, five, six hours. But okay. we can also uh, harvest energy in the process. So, we are in the milliwatts per square centimeter scale now. Mm. 10, 10 to 100 uh, but the fuel cell technology it's like thousands but the cost uh, effectiveness uh, we have to, to think about so uh, I, I would say that photo fuel cells is the future for local generation of energy and also for environmental remediation yeah Thank you very much. Anyway, it's a promising area of work and okay. congratulations. Thank okay. You.